Hello everybody, this is Andrea Tarowski here with Dental L Tutoring. Um, another video for some mock exam questions for you all because I've heard so much from people who had like the first one that I had done and they say please have more because that helps so much. So once again, this is for both dental hygiene and dental assisting students. So I'm just going to go over some mock exam questions for you. I'll go over the answers too for about 10 minutes, so not too long, not too short, and this will help you all study um, to get a little bit of studying at the very least every single day, even if you've just started school or you're not taking the board exam for another six months or four months or whatever, this should be of a great help. And if at any time you have any questions, please let me know. If you do feel like you want some more mock exams, you just have to go to dentalL.com and there's lots there for you. So let's get started. Let me just check my watch here, see what time it is. Okay, perfect. So let's start with question number one here. So medical complications for patients diagnosed with AIDS can be prevented by implementing the following procedures. So A, consulting with the patient's physician prior to treatment. B, postponing dental treatment. C, minimizing aerosol production. Or D, practicing universal standards, also known as universal precautions. So this is a fantastic question. And I hope you all get this right because you really should. Um, uh, well, I can see how a couple answers here you might be thinking of, but always remember, two answers are typically a good answer, but one of them is the best answer. And this applies to both dental hygiene and assisting students. It's the same for the board exam for both of you. They will have two questions that are correct, or sorry, two answers that are correct, but one is always the most correct, so keep that in mind. So what do you guys think? I'll give you guys a couple seconds. What do you guys think about that one? So I'll say the question again. So medical complications for patients diagnosed with AIDS can be preventing by implementing the following procedures. So what do you guys think? Okay, so I'll give you guys the answer. The answer is A. So medical complications for patients diagnosed with AIDS can be presented by consulting with the patient's physician prior to treatment. And this is true for a lot of cases. I mean, if you ever see a patient who's on 20 different medications, you know what? It doesn't hurt to call their physician to ask them about it. But of course, we're in the real world now and you might be thinking, well, Andrea, I don't have time to call the patient's doctor because I'll be put on hold. He may be on lunch, this and this and this. Well, that's true. So that's why I do suggest if you're able to look at your charts the day before and if you need to make phone calls or leave messages, I think that's a fantastic idea and I do this all the time because we pull our charts for the next day, um, the previous morning. So either at lunch or at the end of the day or if I have an opening, I will check the charts and then if I need to make phone calls, if I need to follow up, or I could even be thinking, oh, well this patient was in for their cleaning five months ago. They're not covered yet because it hasn't been six months. Maybe I should let them know, you know, things like that. So I always try to get into the habit of checking your charts the day before if possible. But anyways, let's continue on with some fun questions. I'm having fun. I hope that you're having fun. So next question is, when managing a victim experiencing a grand mal seizure, what treatment should be avoided? So, so important. So A, lower the dental chair and move nearby um, equipment to prevent injury. Or B, loosen tight clothing. C, assessment of open airway and activation of EMS, which means um, emerging emergency medical services, or D, forcing a mouth prop between the teeth to prevent biting the tongue. So which one should you avoid if the patient's having a grand mal seizure? So remember, there's a petite mal seizure and a grand mal seizure. So if you don't know, 
The grand mal is a more severe form, but you should know that at this point. But anyways, so that might help you a bit. So what do you guys think that answer is? What should be avoided? So what not to do, if that makes sense. I'll give you guys a second. What do you guys think? Okay, so the answer is D. So when managing a victim experiencing a grand mal seizure, it, it is best to avoid forcing a mouth prop between the teeth to wedge the mouth open. So this is not the case maybe 10 years ago. They did say you should be, I guess, putting something in the mouth to prevent the patient from biting their tongue. But they soon realized the patient can't do any harm to their tongue. I mean, well, that's not true. They might hurt themselves or do harm to their tongue, but having you put something in their mouth when they're having a seizure and they have no control will likely be a lot worse because they could swallow that something. You could chip a tooth. They could hurt themselves if you're putting something in their mouth that's not there to begin with. So from now on, you should always avoid that. Don't put anything in their mouth. And this question is a very common question on the board exam, so something you should know. Okay, are you guys ready for the next one? I like this one here. Um, let's see how you guys do. So signs and symptoms commonly associated with insulin shock which is otherwise known as hypoglycemia, um, include, and the answers are A, crushing pain in chest, slurred speech, B, cold sweat, weakness and dizziness, C, bluish skin tone, which is also called cyanosis, or D, increased rate of respiration, also known as hyperventilation. So you're breathing really, really fast. So what do you guys think that is? This is an excellent question. I love it. So what are the signs and symptoms of insulin shock? So even without looking at the answers, you, you guys should be thinking in your head what that is and then go from there. So this is a great question. So what do you guys think? What do you guys think? So I'll give you the answer. So the answer is B. So signs and symptoms are, are a cold sweat, weakness, and dizziness. A cold sweat seems to be the most common with hypoglycemia. Um, and it's the most, I guess, easy to observe because sometimes the patient won't be thinking straight and they will not be saying to you, you know, um, Andrea, I'm getting kind of dizzy or Andrea, I'm feeling kind of weak. They might not say that. They usually do, but sometimes if they're not thinking or they don't want to bother you, they might not say anything. But if you notice the patient is starting to sweat, that's not always a good sign. So something to keep in mind. So they could be going through insulin shock. And this commonly happens. Do you guys remember how or why this happens? It commonly happens when a diabetic patient hasn't had breakfast or hasn't had enough to eat, or forgot to take their insulin, or didn't take it appropriately. So uh, an insulin shock could be referred to as a diabetic shock as well, but it's pretty serious, and they need to be given a form of sugar right away before they pass out, because if they pass out, then that's a different situation altogether. But let's just keep things simple, and they need to be given some orange juice, or a glucose tablet, or chocolate even, just whatever you have, a form of sugar, they need to be given that right away. Okay, I think 10 minutes is almost up. Oh my gosh, time goes by so fast. So let me go through one more question here. Okay, so one more question. Which of the following is the recommended method for managing airway obstruction of a foreign body in an adult? Is it a finger sweep if victim is responsive to remove the object? Um, abdominal thrusts, which is known as the Heimlich maneuver. Um, C, check for breathing and pulse, then begin CPR. Or D, place victim in supine position and begin chest compressions. So what do you think? So 
I'll, I'll say the question again. So which of the following is recommended method for managing airway obstruction of a foreign body in an adult? This is a great question because all of these answers sound good to me. Like it sounds like something you should be doing. But look at specifically the question, which is for managing airway obstruction um, of a foreign body. So there's something in the throat obstructing the airway so they can't breathe. So what do you do if the patient's having trouble breathing? So what do you think? I'll give you guys a minute and then I'll give you guys the answer. What do you guys think? So if the patient's having trouble breathing. So the answer is you want to perf uh, perform the Heimlich maneuver. So simply, um, let's go over some of the questions here. So simply checking for breathing and then doing CPR isn't going to help them because they're probably uh, choking, like, you know, like they're choking. So if you start to do CPR, they're going to be like, what the hell heck is this person doing? So you don't want to do that. Um, and placing the patient in a supine position and begin chest compressions won't help because if you're giving them chest compressions, you're not taking out that foreign object which is causing them to choke. So you need to do the Heimlich maneuver. So, okay everybody, well I hope that that helps. 10 minutes always goes by so fast for me, but I like to keep things quick for you guys. I like to keep things easy. And keep in mind that if you do like these uh, videos, make sure to subscribe to my channel on YouTube because then every time I post a new video, an alert will be sent to you to let you know. And I put the videos on Facebook also. So if you would like to subscribe to my YouTube channel and Facebook, that's awesome. Or just subscribe to Facebook or whatever. It's totally up to you. But as always, if you have any questions, please let me know anytime. And stay tuned for the next video.